If you want to take your Bible, you can turn to Isaiah, Isaiah 44. It's right in the middle of the Bible. They used to tell me if you open the Bible in the middle, it'd find, you'd find Psalms. I always found Isaiah. But uh, if you get there, you're close. Isaiah 44. If you didn't bring a Bible, let me encourage you to uh, turn to page 727 in the Pew Bible. Uh, think Boeing, 727. And I say that because the Bible's a big book. And uh, if you're new to the Bible, if you're here with us and you're saying, where in the world is Isaiah? Uh, you know, that's understandable. And let me tell you, the Bible is made up of 66 books, and we love the Bible because it's God's Word. And uh, if you're new, welcome. And if you're new to the Bible, welcome. Uh, that's what we do. Mike said, we worship, and we love to sing to him, and we love to hear from his word. And uh, Isaiah 44 is on page 727 in that pew Bible that you have uh, if you're not working out of your Bible. Isaiah 744 Verse 6a, thus says the Lord. Verse 7a, who is like me? Thus says the Lord, who is like me? Now, I remember early on in my uh, Christian walk, a wise man told me, whenever they put an alpha behind a verse, you know, like 6A or 6B, look out. <laughs> They're taking it out of context. So, I'm not. But I, I want us to stand in honor of God's word and listen to this passage in context. We will start at verse 6, and I will read through verse 8. Uh, there's much more context, obviously, but uh, I think we'll, we'll see that. Lord, I'm so thankful that you're a God who has spoken, that countless times you had it written down, you had it inscripted, inscripturated, Thus says the Lord, give us ears to hear right now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order. From the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God? Besides me, is there any other rock? I know of none. Thank you. You can be seated. We use uh, the term unique, at least I do, uh, in a very sloppy way. We'll say, it was unique. I mean, there were two outs in the ninth, and they came back and scored three runs and won the game. That's not unique. It's rare, but it happens. Unique is unique. <laughs> One and only. I'm talking about today. The unique one. The one and only God. You know, remember that snow day we had um, 
I remember because the first time we ever canceled church in 35 years. I forget what day it was, but we were all hunkered down in our houses, and it was a beautiful Sunday. Remember that? Just, I don't know, January something or other. And uh, I was in Isaiah 40. And I had just a great time sitting there by the wood stove, or the facsimile of the wood stove, the gas stove that all you have to do is turn a button. But anyway, (laughs) I was enjoying the uh, 40th of Isaiah and onward. And I bring that up because I've stayed there. And here it is almost July. And I have been just feasting in Isaiah 40 through 56 over and over. In fact, I backed it up to 36, and I'll tell you why in a minute, to get the historical context. But this section of Isaiah has been so rich, and uh, there are so many themes. And I'll tell you what, uh, one of the themes (laughs) is Christ. You get to Isaiah the 40s, And he's been prophesying about Christ. I mean, this is written 700 B.C., roughly. But he gets more and more specific until you come to that 53rd, probably the pinnacle of prophecy regarding our Savior, Jesus Christ. Only God can tell the end from the beginning. And he says, go ahead, try, in our text here. Uh, But but there are so many themes, and i got to say that it's just been kind of just building up in me, and I keep thinking, I'm going to preach a series on this, you know, and I think I will, but not today, (laughs) just just one, (laughs) but it's, it's kind of like steam, I mean, I was, until about Thursday, I was still planning on the king teaches about the kingdom, part four, and we're going to come back to that, don't worry, but Luke 17, the king of kings teaches about the kingdom, we'll be back. But I've just got to let off some steam, <laughs> okay? I mean, and so I'm go- I hope it's not explosive. I hope it's comforting because this, the themes I'm seeing in Isaiah have been so rich. And I want to just share this with you today. Uh, turn to Isaiah 40. And you'll notice, even what I had us read there in 44, he raises questions And he gives answers. And it's God's teaching method. Jesus used it a lot. (laughs) But he didn't just raise questions. Who is like our God? He gives answers. And we should always, I think, emulate that. We don't just stand here and raise questions. We have the answer. We know who he is. So uh, you'll see this even in the 40th of Isaiah. And I want to just draw your attention to a couple of three verses, and then we'll go from there. Verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Verse 25, To whom will you liken me, that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these stars. To whom would you liken me? Look at chapter 46. 46, verse 5. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me? He is the incomparable one. He is the unique one. You can't make a likeness of him. Don't. You know, he said that right away, didn't he? Okay. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scales, they hire a goldsmith and make it into a god. And they bow down, indeed they worship it. (laughs) They lift it upon the shoulder and carry it. What kind of a god is that? He ridicules anyone who would liken him. (laughs) To whom would you liken me? To who would you compare me? God says. Now, I was, uh, when we were in Luke 15, you remember Jesus giving that beautiful picture of the shepherd going out and finding the lost sheep and carrying it back like a lamb? I was just enjoying that. 
as, I don't know how many weeks ago that was, a few weeks ago. And it was during this time in Isaiah. And I'm thinking about that as I'm reading Isaiah, this big section of Isaiah over and over. And I come to verse 3 here. Chapter 46, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. Listen up. You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I'll be the same. Even to your graying years, I'll bear you. I have done it. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will deliver you. Five times, he says, listen up. I have carried you from the womb. I'll carry on through the graying years. I have borne you since birth. I will carry you on through. Five times he uses bear or carry. And I ran into this as I'm in Luke 15 thinking about Jesus carrying the lamb back. And so I memorized verse 3 and 4 and just enjoyed it and mulled it over. And maybe I've shared it since then. I don't know. In this pulpit, I wouldn't be surprised because I'm sharing it with anybody who'll listen. But then I saw after I'd memorized it, you know, this question again. Whom will you liken me? And make me equal and compare me, verse 5, that we should be alike. Those who lavish gold from the first, oh, they make these beautiful, beautiful temples and beautiful idols. They hire a goldsmith, and they bow down and worship it, and they have to carry it around. <laughs> and I saw the humor in it. God says, I'm the one who carries you. I'll tell you, false gods get heavy. <laughs> they really do. And, of course, we don't usually make our gods with our hands. We usually use our minds. We're advanced. We don't have to do a lot of blue-collar work. We just think. We sit at our terminal, and we just do I can do it from home. You know, that's our culture. And so we think a lot, and, but we still just make them just as well with our minds. And I'll tell you what, false gods that you make up get very heavy. <laughs> they can't deliver you. They can't hear when you pray to them. When I'm in times of trouble, I need God. Not a facsimile. I need the real thing. You need God. We need the one and only Lord of heaven and earth, Yahweh. And if you're new to the Bible, by the way, every time it says L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, in all caps, it's distinguishing in English for us that great name. Sometimes said Jehovah. Uh, we don't really even know how to say his name because the Israelites were so reverent they wouldn't pronounce it. They didn't have any vowels for it. They would just, and so in one sense that tradition has been carried over into English. Uh, but when you see L-O-R-D, all caps, like you'll see it many times today as we look at these things, you're talking about Yahweh. God, Elohim, is Yahweh, the Lord, okay? Well, having said that, that's who, I, that's who I need. Now, um, in times of trouble, I need him. In times of joy, I need him. In times like tomorrow, I don't know what's coming around the corner. I need God. And so what I'm going to do, and I'm going to uh, footnote this, by the way, because um, it's, it's important <laughs> And so I'm going to footnote what I mean by that. I'm going to give you a lot of references. You won't be able to keep up. And uh, I say that because I was talking to a guy this week. In fact, Lance Larson and I were doing some sledgehammer stuff on some uh, concrete. And we sat down and just took a break. And he was telling me how when he first came to Christ, he would just, he didn't want to hear from man. And he said, I'd sit there and you'd say this and you'd say that. I didn't want to hear. I wanted to hear the word. And so I would look up every, and I didn't know where it was in the Bible. I spent my time, and he said, and I said to myself, that's the way it should be. Don't take my word for it. Go to the book. Now, you won't be able to keep up today, so you can jot the footnotes down, you know, the references. But I encourage you to uh, stick around to Isaiah 40 through 
46 or so, and we'll be, that's kind of our home base. But we're going to roam far and wide within a very narrow context. Genesis to Revelation. It's an infinitely broad discovery because God's word is just like God. You'll never plumb the depths of it. We're going to roam wide and far, you know, Genesis to Revelation on this great theme. Who is like me? There is no one like our God. Look at 45, verse 5. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun, from the east to the west. This isn't a western God. This isn't, well, in the east they have a different concept. Uh Uh-uh. God says, I want men to know from the east to the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Now, we're going to hear that time and again, and it has so many implications for us. And by the way, when I say that I need God, that you need God, I mean it. My life takes me to hospitals, to gravesides, to intensive care units. You say, that's why I could never be a pastor. (laughs) And I got to tell you, before I became a pastor, I think I was in a hospital about maybe two or three times. My friend had an appendicitis, you know, eighth grade or something. And I remember my dad got sick one time, big time. And we had to drive up to Portland and go to the hospital. And I I didn't like it at all. And I avoided funerals. (laughs) Who wants to hang around at a funeral or graveside? And I see you? Uh Uh-uh. And I know (laughs) that we're that way because I'm that way. So many of you say, "I, I, I I don't do that. Just get me outdoors where I can enjoy, get me out on the golf course, whatever. All I'm saying is my life takes me there, and yours does too. Yours will too. Uh, And when you find yourself in times of stress, you need God. Three times this week, three times this week, I've had occasion to read a psalm that I'm going to read you. I'm not going to tell you where it is. I'll footnote it afterwards so you don't go looking for it. (laughs) Just listen. Three times I've read it aloud, and three times this week, it's just spoken. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, Had it not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the waters would have engulfed us. The stream would have swept over our soul. Then the raging waters would have swept over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Aren't you glad? We need him, the creator of the universe, who spoke, and it stood fast, the 33rd Psalm. By the way, that's Psalm 124, the whole psalm. Enjoy it. Read it out loud. Uh, Go back to it. Memorize it. Uh, We need, when we face challenges, we need God. When you encounter unexpected difficulties, you need God. Not a false God. Not a facsimile. Not a God of your imagination. You need the one and only true God. The one who's revealed himself who said hundreds of times, thus says the Lord, 
and he doesn't lie. He means what he says. And heaven and earth will pass away, but nothing he says will pass away. Every word I spoke to you is spirit and life, Jesus said. No, we need him. When you get out under the stars, you need God. When you feel those tiny little fingers wrap around your finger, and you, feel, you look down at that little one of yours, you need God. When Jesus comes back, oh, the joy, the comfort. When your days on earth come to a close, we need God. And I'll tell you what, we need God in any and every circumstance. And uh, the great truth that I'm talking about, there is no one like our God. This is the very foundation for worship. And indeed, it's the very foundation for life. When Jesus bowed before the Father, God the Son talking to God the Father, he said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. No, he is life. He is life indeed. He's the very foundation for worship. Just listen to these, and I will turn to them. Sometimes I jot these down, and, uh, but I'm going to at least give you time to process them by, as I flip to these. But he, it's the foundation, the very foundation for worship uh, is that there is no God like our God. There is no one like our God. That's the foundation for worship. Moses, the first author of the books, at the beginning of his ministry, when he had led Israel out of Egypt, and he knew who led Israel out of Egypt. It wasn't Moses. God used a man. God uses a man. And some of these men he uses, they're all pictures of the one he used, the man. But he used Moses, my servant. He said, there'll be a servant like him coming. But he used Moses, and at the very beginning, when they got out, they sang. You remember Exodus 15? They sang. They worshiped. Miriam led them in joyous singing. They sang, and it's called the Song of Moses because it's quoted in heaven. You get to Revelation 15, and Exodus 15 is the Song of Moses that they're singing and praising God with. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your hand, and then he spends the whole chapter talking about the deliverance that's a picture of our deliverance in Jesus Christ. So that's the beginning of Moses' life. At the end of Moses' life, he gets to the end, and oh, how many times I was thinking about it as I read it. You get to another song of Moses. This one's called the Song of Moses, too. In Deuteronomy 13, or 33, at the end of, of, uh, of his writing, here's what he says. There is none like the God of Israel, Jeshurun, who, who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty, the eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He drove out the enemy from before you, and he just is still praising him. There's none like him. Foundation of Moses' worship. And he says, and underneath are those everlasting arms. How many times I heard Elizabeth Elliot quote that verse on the radio as one who's been through the mill and she said, oh, underneath of the everlasting arms. And I've been around dying ones older, and they'll often quote that. We used to sing an old song about that, underneath the everlasting arms, leaning on those everlasting arms. I'll tell you, it's good to know that there is no one like our God. David said, Lord, who is like you? The 35th Psalm. Solomon, when he, you know, remember when Solomon took over, he he, um, he, you know, he called the whole nation together, and he led in this great time of worship. He built the house of the Lord, and it was a fantastic time in Israel's history. And I come to uh, 2 Chronicles 6, verse 14, 
And he said, as he led the whole nation, O oh Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you. In heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and, ha- and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all your heart, who've kept your servant David, my father. And you know, he goes on, but he says, Lord, there is nobody like you. Those other gods, now by the way, God is very aware that there's other gods, small g. False gods. You know, don't have any other gods before me, he says. So don't mistake his words. When I tell you he's the only one, he is the only one. There's false gods. Satan is called the god of this world. There's plenty of small g gods. In Portland, there's one per person. (laughs) Keep Portland weird, you know? Just think your own thoughts. Oh, that's cool. You've got that God. I've got mine. That's why I love living here and ministering here because we can tell them. I was thinking about Dave. I didn't know Dave's topic until they just said it. Uh, The resurrection, the unknown God, telling them who he is. It's exciting to take the news of the one and only true God to people who've got their own little gods that can't help them at all. Got eyes, but they can't see. Got noses, but they can't smell. Got ears, but they can't hear. God says these things about them. You can pray to them all day long. They can't hear you. You don't have to worry about those guys. Isaiah, you know, foundation of worship. Micah, foundation of worship. Jeremiah, oh, listen to this one out of Jeremiah. And I, and I uh, this is chapter 10, verse 7. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name in might. Who wouldn't fear you, O king of the nations? Indeed, it is your due. There is none like you. There is none like you. I repeat, it's the very foundation of all, of all worship. Listen, just listen to some of the Psalms. and You know, the Psalms, the book of worship, so I've already touched on David, but let me come back and read a few more because the other night when we had our small group prayer time, I, I actually wasn't at my neighborhood one. Chris went to the neighborhood one. We had one in the hospital and uh, just impromptu. And I'll tell you what, it was a rich time as we were speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And uh, just listen to God's word, the 71st Psalm, verse 19. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things. Oh, God, who is like you? And that psalm goes on, you know, because of that foundation. That's verse 19, but it starts, In you, Yahweh, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. Oh, God, do not be far from me. Oh, my God, hasten to my help. Oh, God, you've taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. Even when I'm old and gray, oh, God, don't forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, oh, God, reaches to the heavens. You've done great things. Oh, God, who is like you? That's what flows when you stop and think about who God is, that he is the unique one, that kind of truth. Every verse there that I quoted was right out of Psalm 71. Or what should I say about Psalm 89? The faithful one, the great faithfulness of the Lord. Just listen to this, Psalm 89. Who in the skies is comparable to Yahweh? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? None. I interject here because I want to remind you, when the Bible asks these questions, it always gives the answer. It's not saying, you know, who is not. It's, he's, he's teaching us. Who is like you? Oh, a God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones, awesome above all those who are around him. Oh, Lord God of hosts, who is like you? Almighty oh, Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. No wonder David in the 35th Psalm cried out, All my bones will say, Lord, 
Who is like you? Psalm 35, verse 10. Doesn't it get down to your bone when you stop and think about it? Who, all my bones will cry out. And I've seen it time and time again in times of crisis, in times of joy. And if you walk with the Lord and you spend time with his people in the thick and thin of life, you will see the same thing. God is the unshakable, unchangeable, eternal, majestic one. And there's nobody like him. And one of the marvels is that we are so small and twisted that we're ready to settle for anybody but him. Don't you settle for anyone but him. When you face challenges, there is no one like our God. Now, I know, it is, of course, the spirit of our day to say, there are many gods. Uh, yours is not really all that different. Don't, who are you? <laughs> You Christians. And just by saying it that way, they relegate God to you Christians. There are many cultures, many traditions, many ways of looking at life. Who are you to say? By the way, we don't say. He says. I'll tell you who he is to say. He's the one and only true God. And he has said it from the beginning. I'm it. Don't you have any other gods before me? I'm a jealous God. That's who, that's who is to say. The one who spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. The one who loves us. The one who cares for us. The one who says, oh, don't you have any other gods? Don't you make any other images? Don't you make any gods up? There is no other. I know of none. Do you know of any other rocks? Do you know of any other saviors? I know of none. That's who's to say. But you see, we live in a day where we make our own god up, and as I already said, you can have as many gods as there are people in a room, little personal deities that we make up. And the 50th Psalm said, when we do that, we think God is just like us. We usually make God up in our own image. And so you have a lot of, you know, you go to Romans 1 and you'll see that uh, people exchange gods and the truth of God for a lie. And they'll make up gods in their own image. And uh, it's very, very sad. But of course, that's the spirit of our day, but it's the spirit of Isaiah's day too. <laughs> and it's the spirit of every generation since Adam sinned. There's been this tendency to exchange the truth of God for a lie. In Sennacherib's day, which was Isaiah's day, Sennacherib was king of the world, so he thought. And he was coming and mowing the countries down. And that's why I went back, by the way, to Isaiah 36 in my reading and rereading, because 36, 37 are the historical backdrop for the 40s and 50s where Isaiah was living. And boy, Sennacherib came in, and he was, there was nobody who was a match for him. And he came, and you remember the story, if you don't go read it, it's recorded for us in Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah. So I think God wants us to learn from it. And uh, he was, he said, have any of the other gods of these other nations stopped me? I'm like a steamroller. They've cried on their gods. They've cried on, do you think you're a little god? And here's what he said, basically. I'm quoting 2 Chronicles 32, 19. They, Sennacherib and his spokesman, they spoke of the God of Jerusalem as of the gods of the peoples of the earth, the work of men's hands. They spoke of God as a God. And Isaiah, or King Hezekiah, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, prayed about this and cried out to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed every mighty warrior, commander, and officer in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned in shame to his own land. And when he'd entered the temple of his God, some of his own children killed him there with the sword. That's how much that God could help him. His own sons killed him. You can read about it in Isaiah in more detail, but that's a pithy uh, summary in Second Chronicles 32 of what took place. No, um, 
When you get out under the stars, you need God. This morning at 4, I got up, and I went out thinking, I'm going to do that, because I was thinking about this, you know. So I go out, and there's nothing but clouds. I live in Oregon. <laughs> but it was light clouds, you know. And uh, I go out again at 4.30, and the clouds are pink, just a little bit. Because, I mean, what are we, the longest day of the year? I mean, the sun was already coming up. A little bit, not coming up, but you know what I mean. Day to day pours forth speech. You get out under the stars. Uh, look at Isaiah 40 again. Are you still there? Isaiah 40. Verse 25. To whom then would you liken me, that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. There are a couple hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. Our little galaxy, our vast galaxy. So big that until 1924, man thought that was it. And we can't plumb the depths of the Milky Way, really. Hubble set up that telescope down at Mount Wilson, and in 1924, they realized there's more than this galaxy. And that alone is just mind-blowing. But then you start reading the literature, and soon they found out there's several more. <laughs> and then you can look it up in an old encyclopedia, old as in 10 years old, and you'll find that there, they've found that there's millions of galaxies. And then hundreds of millions of galaxies. And now the wise ones just say, we don't know how many there are. There could be a terabyte. Remember when terabytes came out? Oh, you got gigs, huh? I got a terabyte. We're so impressed with man's little bit knowledge, you know what I mean? And it is impressive because we're created in the image of God, and I'm blown away that you can have a terabit hard drive in your coat pocket or whatever. But I'm telling you what, we can't invent words big enough for God. You get out under the stars, and you ask this question, who is like you? The one who formed their, calls forth their host. Look at verse 26. He calls them all by name. He's got a name for every star. We're talking about the infinite one. Oh, it's good to know him, isn't it? You need to know him when you get out under the stars. When you experience real trouble, oh, listen to this, Psalm 86. In the time of trouble, the psalmist says, in the day of my trouble, verse 7, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. For you, Lord, verse 5, are good and ready to forgive, abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. When you are guilty, when you are feeling the shame and the guilt of your failure, and when you've tried saying everybody does it, I don't, I'm not so bad. When you have felt the weight of your sin and those little things like everybody does it and stuff just isn't paying off. It's just not enough. When you're really feeling it, you can say what Micah said. Listen to this, if I can find Micah. Because you find this truth all through the Scripture. Verse 18, who is like you? Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Who is like that? Nobody. Save one. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham 
which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. You don't change. Oh, who is like you? You took our sins and put them as far as the east is from the west. No wonder we worship him. No wonder this great truth is the foundation for worship and life. I close with this. Turn to Isaiah 44. Or did I say 44? I mean 5. But I'm telling you what, I hope you'll go and read this whole section with this thought in mind and enjoy it. But Isaiah 45. When Jesus returns, you and I need God. We need the unchanging God, the one and only true God, the incomparable God, the unique God. Oh, the joy of beholding him when he returns. Oh, the comfort. If he takes you, if he takes you the way he's taken most believers home through the gateway of death, if he doesn't come in our lifetime, you need him just the same. I'm telling you, if he takes you that way, you will be home. To be absent from the body is to be at home. Uh, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you, but I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, let not your heart be troubled. This is great comfort to know this truth. To know that to be absent from the body is to be at home with him. To be, depart and be with Christ is very much better. Philippians 1, 23. Oh, enjoy that. Now Isaiah, who has, by the Holy Spirit, given us a thus says Yahweh. About a hundred of them, huh? Isaiah's 45. I'm just going to pick it up at verse 20. Gather yourselves and come. Draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. You see, this isn't just for Israel. It's for anybody and everybody. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden aisle and pray, idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Don't depend on your false gods. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, Yahweh, the Lord? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me, God, the only God, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord of lords and King of kings, that to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. Oh, Paul had this on his heart and mind when he said, because Jesus humbled himself to the point of death, God has raised him up and seated him far above every other seat and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They will say, verse 24, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him and all who were angry at him shall be put to shame. Oh, Philippians 2 is based right out of Isaiah 45. When Philip said, oh, Lord, show us the Father. It's enough for us. Jesus said to him, what? Philip, have I been so long with you and you've not come to know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the incomparable, one and only, unique, God of heaven and earth. Do you hear what he said? Do I hear what he said? Oh, if you want to know God, know Jesus. And there is none like him. Our holy, 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 
triune God. We love him. We worship him. He is worthy of our praise. He is mighty to save. Turn to me and be saved. Oh, praise his holy name. Father, we thank you.